On March 18, 1986, Len Bias would play his final game of organized basketball. The University of Maryland faced off against the University of Nevada Las Vegas in the second round of the March Madness tournament for the West region. Fighting for a chance to enter the Sweet 16 and keep their team seasons alive, a lot was on the line. Bias, filling the moment, came out swinging. He missed his first two shot attempts, both coming from the deep right corner. He got on the stat sheet with two rebounds. His first make would be a contact layup that looked like an and one, but the call on the floor stated that he converted the two points, but would be hit with an offensive foul following the basket, which is both rare and confusing. Lenny spared no time for idleness because his second basket was a quick time lob off the right block. Making insane athletic feats look mundane is what made Bias a nationwide star. Especially when you consider this was back in 1986, guys weren't jumping like that. Bias had UNLV's undivided attention, seeing a swarm of rebels anytime the ball was pointed in his direction. And he loved that right baseline. Every single play for him started there. His first jumper connected from that same zone, and it looked smooth, but it didn't count. He'd shoot from the same spot again, but would come up short. His shots were just off by a little. Bias was snagging on a glass though and was getting his money down low. He had 8 points and 5 rebounds on 4 of 9 shooting from the field. At the half, it was UNLV 33, Maryland 27. Bias was incapable of impacting the game due in large part to the Rebels' thorough game plan of denying him the ball. Bias was struggling by the start of the second half, but he saw one midi go in and the engine started. He follows that mid-range jumper by reminding the audience why he was the star of Maryland basketball. Maryland started the second half with a purpose, going on a 12-0 run. Bias was productive at the line, going 9 for 9 for the game. He was an abnormally great free throw shooter for a forward in his era. His senior year, he averaged 7.5 free throw attempts on 86%. Those numbers would be elite in any era. He had 14 points with 8 minutes left in the game. He'd finished the game with 31. Feeling the fire rising, he started cooking late. That's a tough and one. And track the coordinates where you'd expect him to be right baseline. Bias was keeping the game within reach single-handedly. This was a masterful closing act because he was draining shots over a sea of outstretched arms. But Maryland couldn't get a stop against 11th ranked UNLV who had a total record of 31-5 and, and boasted the second highest scoring offense in the PCAA now known as the Big West Conference. UNLV played the foul game and closed any window of opportunity that could have been presented to Maryland. The fixture concluded with a score of 70 UNLV, 64 Maryland. The Rebels would advance to the next round of the March Madness tournament where they'd face Auburn, losing 70-63. Bias would receive a standing ovation for his heroic effort in his final game of collegiate basketball, and grimly, in retrospect, his final game ever. The Boston Celtics select Len Bias of the University of Maryland. People think he may be the best athlete in the draft. Well, he certainly has to be about the happiest man. For as hyped as Len Bias was, he wasn't selected first overall in the 1986 NBA draft. That honor went to Brad Doherty from UNC. Doherty averaged 20 points per game and 9 rebounds on 65% field goal percentage in his senior year. The Chapel Hill big man was a monster who took his Tar Heels to the Sweet 16. Doherty and Bias were the consensus two best draft prospects in the country. It was a battle of A versus AB. The tough part was figuring out who was which. Coincidentally, both the Cavaliers and the Celtics had traded their way into the top two spots. So each team had talents on their roster they'd have to take into consideration when drafting. Now in this case, the answer was clear for Boston. Whichever guy is remaining, you draft him. Simple. Cleveland had a tougher decision to make. 
They had Roy Hinson, a 24-year-old stud who was coming off a season average in 20 and 8 on 50%. Hinson was 6'9", 210 pounds. Bias was 6'8", 210 pounds. And this was long before the era of lineups consisting of two to three tall forwards. Sure, with enough talent, you can make anything work. But baby Cleveland was in need of a five. The starting center was Melvin Turpin. Melvin Turpin was actually kind of solid. I don't really understand the pick to be honest. Maybe Cleveland really believed Doherty was that much better than Bias and was too good to pass up. But by universal accounts, these two were neck and neck in terms of ability and only one of them was being compared to Michael Jordan. So maybe the answer could be something physical. Both were great athletes, but this was the 80s and old school ball was dominated by the big men. Cleveland probably swung for the 7 footer over the shorter bias. Plus, Doherty came from UNC and they just exported Sam Perkins who made the all rookie team and oh yeah, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. He's just a great athlete. I've seen him play many times, I've seen him practice many times. He's got good work habits, he's a good kid, he's going to play. You ever heard of the word insurance? He's pretty good insurance. Red Arback, yes, that Red Arback. The Boston Celtics president at that time and their former legendary coach who won the season nine championships. This was the kind of praise Bias was receiving before he even stepped on a basketball court at the professional level. This man coached Bob Cousy, Sam Jones, Carl Braun, and Bill Russell. Praise from someone of that magnitude is not taken faintly. That shows the tremendous talent and skills Bias possessed. A once in a generation kind of baller. He's maybe the closest thing to Michael Jordan to come out in a long time. I'm not saying he's as good as Michael Jordan, but he's an explosive and exciting kind of player like that. That's what Celtics scout Ed Badger had to say after watching six games of Bias. What's so funny about this statement is that this was in 1986. Mike was in the league for only two years at that point, but regardless, he was Michael Jordan and Bias was to be his nemesis. Len Bias was destined to be one half of the face of the league alongside Michael Jordan. They were supposed to be the rivalry of the future. Bias was meant to be the bird to Jordan's magic. The comp was justified on the surface because Leonard possessed a lot of abilities MJ did that made him a running gun straight out the gate. He had an explosive first step, a muscular physique, go-to jump shot. His creativity stood out in an era of rigid scoring mechanics. His big body plus his incredible athleticism allowed him to maneuver to any spot on the court. He had his preferences. The defense was aware, but they simply weren't strong or fast enough to counter him. Where Jordan used his otherworldly leaping ability to go over guys, Bias would go through them. MJ averaged almost 30 in his first season, and this guy was a bigger version of him with a more reliable jump shot. MJ didn't polish his arsenal until the later parts of his career, and comparing their college statistics indicates Bias was the superior. Granted, MJ played with Sam Perkins who was drafted 4th overall, one pick after Mike in 84, and Brad Doherty, the number one overall pick in 86, taken ahead of Bias. But hey, even being half as good as Michael Jordan puts you on the upper shelf, so if Bias could replicate even a portion of Jordan's success, Boston would be ecstatic. The Celtics won 67 games the prior season. Larry Bird was coming off an MVP season that saw him average 26 points per game, 10 rebounds, 7 assists, 2 steals on 50% from the field, 42% from 3, and 90% from free throw. This man put up 25, 10, and 7 a night on 50, 40, 90 splits before the World Wide Web was invented. And his number 2 averaged 21, 8, and 2 blocks and was selected to the all-defensive first team. That was Boston's second option. Man, basketball in New England must have been glorious back in those days. And to top it all off, they won the championship that year. The Boston Celtics won the NBA championship and were rewarded with the second overall pick immediately after. This was the last team that needed Len Bias' service. And guess what? They'd make it back to the finals despite what happened to Bias. The draft was held on the 17th of June. Len Bias returned to the University of Maryland campus on the 18th. 
That night, he went to a party around 2 a.m. and returned to his dormitory at 3 a.m. Bias was young, and he was rich. The man was an NBA player from the 17th onwards. He'd signed a five-year, $1.6 million deal with Reebok, which is 4.5 mil today if you factor in inflation. With all that money, it's no shock a young man of his stature would fall to some of the most heinous vices. His father alleged that he'd spent over $11,000 in the months leading up to the draft, so he was no virgin to splurging. And considering the time period, I can think of a certain substance one might partake in that could run them a hefty tab when purchasing in higher volumes frequently. In the late night of the 19th, Bias snorted co until dawn after returning to his dorm room with his buddy Brian Tribble and some of his Maryland teammates. Sometime after 6 a.m., Bias suffered a seizure and collapsed in front of his teammate. At 6.32 a.m., Brian Tribble dialed 911 and reported Bias' status. The ambulance would arrive at 6.36. At 6.50, Bias was transported to Leland Memorial Hospital. By 8.55 on the morning of June 19, 1986, Len Bias was pronounced deceased from cardiac arrest at the age of 22. A urine sample was taken at Leland Memorial when EMTs attempted to revive him, which detected traces of cocaine. Heart attacks in a young athlete are rare, so the evidence pointed to the COD being drug-related regardless of the urine sample. A grand jury would conduct an investigation into the matter. Three people were indicted after Bias's passing. His Maryland teammates, Terry Long and David Gregg, were charged with possession of cocaine and obstruction of justice. Brian Tribble was tried for possession and distribution of cocaine. All charges were dropped against Long and Greg in exchange for their testimony against Tribble, who was believed to be the supplyman for Bias and possibly his other Maryland teammates and associates. The Maryland players testified that a substantial amount of product was laid out on a mirror in Bias's dormitory when they entered the room the night of Bias's passing. Greg stated that he asked Tribble how he came to possess such a large pile of cocaine, to which Tribble replied, it came from the bottom of the stash and that he said another kilo is coming tomorrow. A jury would rule Tribble not guilty on all counts on June 3rd, 1987, almost a year after Bias's demise. During final arguments, Tribble would be labeled a dope dealer by prosecutor Robert Bonsib. The prosecutor implied that Tribble saw Bias as a meal ticket and wanted to quote unquote attach himself to this rising star. Along with Bias's teammates' testimonies, the prosecution had a key witness in 17-year-old Terrence Moore who allegedly distributed coke for Tribble. Jurors didn't find the witness to be a credible source, however. Reading an excerpt from a Washington Post article after the verdict, the jury gave little credence to the prosecution's theory that Tribble, Bias, and Terrence Moore were co-conspirators in Tribble's alleged cocaine distribution network. Moore's testimony was crucial to prove the theory. Moore testified that he sold up to 100 half-gram packages of cocaine a day for Tribble around Montana Avenue in Northeast Washington and frequently spotted Bias in that area known for drug sales. But his testimony was considered unbelievable, jurors said. Juror Doris Walker said she found it hard to believe that Bias, whose face was well known from newspaper articles and televised Turpin games, would hang around a known drug market, as Moore claimed. Trying to prove that a basketball star what a good reputation was dealing on the side, based on word of mouth, made the testimony paper strong. So there simply wasn't enough evidence to prove that Len Bias was a dough dealer or that Tribble supplied the product to Len Bias, which would ultimately end his life. Brian Tribble would walk free from the Bias case, but would later be indicted along with 26 others linked to an organization named the Woodridge Group after a two-year undercover investigation by the feds. 
he would be sentenced to 10 years in prison. Back during the bias case, the defense attorney Thomas Morrow was quoted saying, this whole trial is a whitewash, an attempt to divert attention from the University of Maryland to somebody whom the state thinks is a nobody. Morrow's indication wasn't an unpopular sentiment as many believed the University of Maryland, specifically its athletics program, had dirtied hands in the matter. There were reports the school was negligent and played ignorant in regards to Len Bias's academic struggles. James Bias, Leonard's father, would reaffirm this accusation. Amidst the drama, athletic director Dick Dull, crazy ass name, and 17 year head coach Lefty Drissel would both resign. I've known Leonard since he was in about the sixth grade. He's like a son to me. Lefty Drissel saved 10 kids when four townhouses caught on fire while he was surf fishing back in 1973, for which he was awarded the NCAA Award of Valor and was labeled a hero. Bias's passing is believed to be the domino that set into motion the creation of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 signed off by President Ronald Reagan. Now trying to break down the impact this law had on society would not fit the scope of this video. But if you're even somewhat knowledgeable about US legislation, then you know how important this law was during the war on drugs and is still today in American culture. So, considering that it's sometimes referred to as the Len Bias Law, his death was significant to say the least. But let us move away from the grim circumstances surrounding Bias's finale and appreciate his time on earth. Someone who has been credited by plenty as an individual that worked his ass off despite his many gifts. Someone who would always speak about his teammates and those around him rather than gloating about his personal accomplishments. Someone loved and respected by those around him beyond basketball. Everyone has their demons and unfortunately, Lenny succumbed to his. But let his death be a reminder about the fragility of life and how it can be stripped from us at any time. One unfortunate night, the night after his most fortunate, turned a future NBA superstar into what could have been. Left a brother, father, and mother mourning for their kin rather than celebrating. From the podium of the NBA draft to the moratorium of Leland Memorial Hospital. Thanks for watching.